Welcome to today's webinar, Clinical Care for Ataxia. Please note that all attendees are in listen-only mode and that this webinar is being recorded. I'm Lori Shogren, Community Program and Services Director for the National Ataxia Foundation, and I'll be assisting with today's webinar along with our Communications Manager, Stephanie Lucas. Questions for our webinar speakers can be typed in the questions tab found in your control panel and uh, we'll do our very best to answer as many questions as possible during our time together here today. Speaking with you today are the excellent clinicians from the University of Colorado and the Colorado Children's Hospital. Dr. Abigail Collins is a pediatric movement disorders neurologist who specializes in caring for children and young adults with genetic and metabolic disorders, including any and all disorders with ataxia as a symptom. She's been practicing in Denver at the Children's Hospital in Colorado since 2008. And Dr. Trevor Hawkins is an assistant professor at the University of Colorado and the co-director of the University of Colorado Ataxia Clinic. He also sees patients at the Eastern Colorado VA Medical Center. And Dr. Lauren Seberger is a neurologist specializing in movement disorders. She provides treatment and care for patients with movement disorders such as ataxia, at the University of Colorado Ataxia Clinic. Now I'll invite Dr. Seberger to start us off with today's talks. Welcome, Dr. Seberger. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. So the team from the University of Colorado would like to welcome you to today's webinar. We really miss getting to see you here in Denver. So we thank the NAF and we applaud their work in making this presentation and all those from the meeting possible. So we do have some disclaimers. Um, and, and these I've heard you've seen before, but just generally that the information provided by us today is for informational use only, and that you really should be consulting with your um, care physicians, your providers, about any and all recommendations and any and all treatments that you would have for your ataxia. And then lastly, that the products or series that we mention here does not imply endorsement by the NAF or speakers. The next are our financial disclosures uh, for Dr. Collins, Aridel Biosystems, for Dr. Trevor Hawkins, none. For me, work with Fallon Medica, Riata Pharmaceuticals, and Biohaven Pharmaceuticals. So I'd like to start with uh, clinical care. And so today we're really gonna be covering clinical care in ataxia, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis in our clinics, what advice we might give, and what treatments we may prescribe. So the first thing to do is really go over what the um, appropriate care is and what are the basics of that care. So appropriate care really has three parts. And the first is the correct identification of the symptoms and interpretation of the exam findings by the doctor. This can be very complicated as people with ataxia, there's so many different causes and many neurologists um, have difficulty making these judgments and certainly primary care physicians may as well. Second step in really good clinical care would be the correct workup, really aimed at trying to identify a cause if possible. And this workup can include laboratory assessments to uncover treatable causes of ataxia, such as a vitamin deficiency or a metabolic problem, among others. And of course, we would treat those things uh, if we found them. The doctor really should be looking at clinical cues from the history and the exam to guide this workup, which can range, it's all kinds of different levels of workup can be done. The third tenet of good care is, of course, good clinical care, treating symptoms to improve quality of life and function. So I'm gonna start the presentation with the treatment of motor symptoms or ataxia symptoms seen in cerebellar ataxia. Then Dr. Collins will speak about treatments of non-ataxia symptoms that sometimes will accompany ataxia syndromes. And we'll round out the discussion with Dr. Hawkins covering the use of marijuana and CBD. So, um, Let's go. 
So as you all know, the cerebellum is a small but mighty part of the brain, connecting motor areas which really serve to fine-tune and coordinate our movements and help with the learning of movement patterns as well as helping the body to predict what adjustments are needed to perform a new movement. There are now known to be many non-motor functions of the cerebellum that are related to emotion and cognition. And this is an incredibly exciting area of new study, and we look forward to breakthroughs there in the future. Today, we're going to be focusing really on the work done in the last few decades on the treatment of cerebellar motor dysfunction. The signs of cerebellar dysfunction are motor problems causing ataxia of gait, which is disturbances of standing or walking, balance problems that can cause abnormal walking and can lead to falls, incoordination of the arms and legs, also known as limb ataxia, which causes disruption in fine movements and even large movements needed for independence and activities, problems with eye movements that can cause impaired vision due to inability to stabilize the gaze or problems with the eyes moving together, and speech difficulties, which may cause slow slurred speech that may interfere with communication. So at this point in time, there are no FDA approved medications for motor symptoms of ataxia. However, there have been many medications that have been tested, and there is some information about what treatments might be worth trying. And today I'll be discussing medications and supplements with scientific evidence of benefit. So the first of these is moderate evidence for a, a certain type of ataxia, episodic ataxia type 2, in which two medications, acetazolamide and aminopyridine, may work to reduce the number of ataxia attacks or episodes. There's also moderately good evidence for aminopyridine helping some causes of gait ataxia and eye movements that could be seen in some cerebellar dysfunctions. So let's break this down in detail over the next two slides. So acetazolamide works in the brain to increase a chemical called GABA, and this, this transmitter helps to inhibit certain transmissions, and it can actually change the way the cerebellum sends its signals and theoretically can improve the way the cerebellum talks to the motor part of the brain. This medication reduces attacks in episodic ataxia type 2, and interestingly, an older trial showed that it might help some with gait, but newer work has not borne that out. As it is, we definitely use this medication in clinic, typically for EA2. Um, it can be tried for cerebellar ataxia gait symptoms, but just bear in mind that the proof is not as strong and there may be side effects that need to be observed. Aminopyridines can help normalize the discharges coming from the, cerebellar dis, uh, the cerebellum nerve cells as well. And there are two types of aminopyridines. The, the type that we use the most is called 4AP, and this crosses into the brain more easily. So this is the one that's really been tested the most in ataxia. This medication is FDA approved, 4AP, to help with walking and multiple sclerosis. Several trials in different types of ataxia using 4AP have shown some improvements in different types of cerebellar motor problems, such as swaying while you stand, the time it takes for you to walk. It may also help with stabilization of the eyes in SCA6, lessening the jumpiness of vision. And one of you sent in an, an early question to the uh, seminar about eye movements and cerebellar ataxia. So I'll just say briefly that um, this type of movement in SCA6 is downbeat nystagmus, a type of eye movement abnormality in which uh, the, the gaze can't be held steady, there's a tendency for the eye to come down and then drift back up, and it causes the sensation of the world moving uh, that we call oscillopsia. So the eyes really having a difficult time holding the vision steady, and so things can look blurred or even jumpy. So as you see on the right half of the slide, the 4AP has been shown not only to improve gait in MS, but also in hereditary, sporadic, and episodic ataxias. So these modest short-term gains have really um, led us to research this medication more, and there are two ongoing trials looking at a long-term, a long-acting formulation of 4AP. 
So you've sensed a theme that most of the medications that we've been using have somehow modified the way the cerebellum talks to the motor part of the brain. And this is true for Riliazol as well. Um, in addition to modulating that cerebellum, it also uh, tends to limit excessive glutamate in the brain. And I think about glutamate like chocolate cake, a little bit is good, but maybe too much is not. So um, this does seem to be helpful in certain types of ataxia. It's been trialed in SCAs as well as free drugs. So these early trials have led to further research in this compound, and you're probably all familiar with the current clinical trials of troriliazole that are ongoing in certain autosomal dominant ataxias. And so briefly, troriliazole is a prodrug to riliazole, meaning it's absorbed by the body and quickly forms riliazole. It was manufactured to be absorbed easily, not to interfere with food, to be able to be easier on the liver than riliazole, which you have to check liver function tests with that one. And also troriliazole was manufactured to be a once a day medication. So moving on to supplement, supplements, generally, most supplements tried for cerebellar ataxia do not have sufficient evidence to justify their widespread use. And that includes things such as 5-HTP, ashwagandha, choline, and even to a large extent, coenzyme Q10. But having said that, I know that many of you are on supplements, and I know that we recommend supplements to some of our patients. So I guess what I'm saying here is that the science hasn't been able to uh, define uh, a higher level of benefit so that we could recommend it for everyone. But this is best done with your primary care physician or your neurologist having a discussion about what supplements may work for you. So the supplement I'll talk about is acetyl-DL leucine. It's the one kind of hottest in research right now. Um, it's a derivative amino acid used to treat dizziness and vertigo. Leucine is the amino acid, which is called an essential amino, amino acid, meaning that um, our body can't make this particular amino acid. We have to take it in our diet. And it's thought that acetyl-DL leucine stabilizes membranes, particularly in nerve cells involved in the balance center and in the cerebellum. So you can see it would be very important for us. Clinical experience has shown that it is well tolerated at five grams per day in these clinical trials without any serious uh, effects. And an open label trial, um, since these are promising, we're looking at further research and a large scale trial of over 100 people with ataxia um, are being tested right now, taking the medication against a placebo. So again, before I move on to the next section, which is intervention therapies, I just want you to bear in mind that there might be many medications um, that I have not mentioned that some of you may be taking, and you're taking it for your walking and such. And as I said, these medications just may not have strong enough evidence, but it doesn't mean that they won't work for your particular case. So, Interventions. So I'd like to talk, this is a little experimental here um, because these things are not um, currently uh, approved for use in ataxia, but I wanted to talk about them and I had reached out to Sue Perlman before she gave her uh, research talk just to see if she was going to talk about these and she was not going to cover them. So I felt like it would be a nice time to, to cover these um, interventions. Having said that, the intervention that we know works the best currently for ataxias is physical therapy. And I, I've heard that you've had an excellent um, webinar on that, and so I'll refer you to the National Ataxia Foundation for more information about the benefit of physical therapy on ataxia. Okay, so we'll start with transcranial magnetic stimulation, also known as TMS because it's a mouthful. Uh, TMS is a non-invasive tool that uses magnetic fields to stimulate underlying parts of the brain, such as the cerebellum. A treatment coil is placed on the skull over the area that we want to stimulate, then a computer program is used to deliver a series of short bursts of magnetic energy to the brain. It has been FDA approved for use in depression, and thousands of people have been treated with 
uh, TMS worldwide without safety concerns. So just to let you know what's going on in cerebellar ataxia, since 1999, there have been a small number of patients um, who have been treated with TMS. And this work has led to the conclusion that TMS over the cerebellum possibly improves motor functioning with faster walking, greater number of tandem steps in a row, and longer standing times at 21 days after 21 days of TMS treatment. The, the questions that remain unanswered, since we know the effects of this do fade, is which brain site should be stimulated? What are the number of sessions needed? As well as what time interval do we need in between sessions to maintain benefits? So more research definitely needed in that area, but um, we're, we're excited about that one. And the next uh, intervention I would like to describe to you is transcranial direct current stimulation. And I'll just call this one uh, DCS. Again, a non-invasive tool, but this time using electric fields to stimulate the brain underneath. It's a very simple device with electrodes that are placed over the areas to be stimulated. There's usually two electrodes, a positive and a negative, so that current um, flows between them and creates the field. This is the setup here. She's connected to the computer and she has one of the electrodes on her head. So this is a relative newcomer in ataxia research uh, with studies only been published since 2013. Small studies though have uh, found better SARA scores and gait mechanics in those who got stimulation versus those who were sham, who, who did not get stimulation. And I wanted to make you aware of this research because I thought it was very interesting. So this is a really well-designed trial from 2018 using stimulation over the cerebellum and also the lumbar spinal cord in 20 patients with neurodegenerative ataxia. And it really gave good level evidence that it was of benefit and also that it was safe. It seemed as though those less affected were the ones that showed the greatest improvement clinically. And they improved in gait scores and their movement of their fingers and uh, balance. Uh, the improvement of, the, of those less affected indicated that perhaps earlier treatment might be better. And this was really interesting because these effects lasted at least three months, but they were found to be gone by six months. So this small study, positive results, plus the low cost of these devices and their ease of use and relative lack of side effects, make this another area that I think is, is ripe for further research. Uh, again, trying to figure out how often they would need to be given and what would be the best sites that we would stimulate. I'm, um, I'm really actually thinking about doing a, a trial here with the transcranial uh, direct current stimulation because I think it's so interesting. Um, so the last of the bunch is um, deep brain stimulation. Since 1997, deep brain stimulation has been used to treat tremor in essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. And since then, different brain targets and different types of diagnoses have been um, treated with DBS, including obsessive compulsive disorder. And there have been a few cases, about 20 to 30 in the literature, that show the use of DBS surgery for very severe tremor in cerebellar ataxia, a tremor that just wasn't um, improved by any other means. And so these patients were uh, debilitated, having difficulty doing their activities of daily living. And so it was uh, essentially a bit of a last resort for them. And in these cases, DBS was reported to help tremor in all the patients to some degree, some more than others. Some also reported some improvement in ataxia. So that was a few of the, of the 20 plus reported cases. But I will give a cautionary note in that in the cases reported so far, the majority of patients did report some worsening of their gait. Um, so this is an area that uh, needs to continue to be explored, and I think it will be done on a case-by-case -case basis like this. And there's interest in using other areas of the brain to stimulate. Perhaps one of the cerebellar uh, structures might be better for cerebellar ataxia. So lots of uh, unanswered questions in those last three interventions. But again, we look forward to seeing what research is done there in future. 
So for the next part of the talk, I'll hand it over to Dr. Collins. Um, she's going to be discussing non-ataxia symptom management and cerebellar ataxia. And I'm going to be moving her slides, so she's going to tell me what to do. All right. Um, great. So next slide. Um, so my, my first slide actually uh, was going to introduce um, the model here. Um, the model is um, a drawing that my son did for his fifth grade anatomy class um, at school. And so uh, he named this uh, model Ricardo. And Ricardo is um, going to be demonstrating the various aspects of associated symptoms of ataxia that we're going to be discussing uh, in terms of treatment and management. Um, we're going to be going through a whole number of symptoms, but we're not going to be discussing all of the associated symptoms with ataxia because that takes um, too much time for the amount of time we have allotted today for this talk. The other thing I want to mention is that um, any of the drugs that I'm going to be talking about, it's important to understand that dosing and side effects are going to be very important to consider and to discuss with any prescribing physicians and that these are going to be variable from person to person um, although some of the concerning side effects i probably will mention to let people know what a concern might be if the medication is prescribed and then other medications are going to be described for off-label uses altogether and so medications that were not approved for a specific indication but where we sometimes use them um, for a different uh, effect when we know that it can be helpful. So in terms of the symptoms, the first symptom we want to talk about is cognition. And cognition is very important because, can you uh, go back, Lauren? Uh, thank you. Cognition is very important because um, thinking uh, is uh, affected in cerebellar ataxias. And we know this to be the case from a lot of the work that Dr. Schmaman has done in um, the cognitive and affective disorders associated with ataxias. But I think the most important thing to think about, first of all, is that there are mimics of cognitive impairments that really, really have to be investigated and ruled out. Things like B vitamin B12 deficiency, thyroid abnormalities, depression, insufficient sleep, and most importantly, medications as, and side effects of other medications being used to treat symptoms, which can interfere with cognitive function. And the reason it's super important to think about these things is because these are potentially treatable and reversible causes of cognitive impairments that we really do not want to miss. The second thing is that it's very important to adapt your expectations around what your cognitive abilities are going to be and how those are going to change over time. And one of the things that I talk about um, with patients, and especially my older patients um, in my pediatric practice and with the adults when I was previously seeing adults over at the university, is that one of the cognitive skills we take for granted and we rely a lot on is rapid set shifting. And what that means is switching your attention from one thing to another and then switching your attention back. And for people with cerebellar uh, impairments and cognitive effects of that, Rapid set shifting, also called multitasking, can be super difficult. It can be really, really hard to do. And it's important then to recognize this and understand um, both in, uh, as an individual with ataxia or as a, a family member of someone with, with ataxia, that that rapid shifting of attention can be very difficult for somebody to do. And it's best to minimize that as much as possible where you pay attention to one thing, do it as, as, as much as you need to, and then shift your attention, because when you shift back, you're gonna to have to start over with that other activity. And so it's important to set expectations with family members, and especially with employers, if you're still in a job and working a job, to reduce that kind of set shifting at, at all possible. Like with other areas in neurology, it's important to stay active mentally. And so activities that can be stimulating mentally can improve your cognition, including reading, doing puzzles, playing games, et cetera. So not just watching TV, not just passively taking in things, but actively engaging your mind and your brain in order to work on areas that you may be struggling with. Physical exercise also is really important in terms of maintaining and facilitating cognitive function. It should not be underestimated, the effect of physical exercise Minimum 20 to 30 minutes three times a week is what is recommended. If you can do more, that's better. It doesn't have to be exhaustive physical exercise, even um, walking or recumbent um, arm cycle or swimming is um, 
really good exercise. There are some specific medications which have been developed primarily for use in Alzheimer's disease. These are considered memory medications, which can be helpful um, for people who have cognitive impairments related to ataxia. Um, and those include medications like Nemenda, also called Memantine, um, Aricept, uh, Exelon, and um, Razidine. And then stimulant medications can sometimes be helpful too. And in um, brackets, I put there that they may also be helpful for fatigue, which I'm not going to be talking about separately as a symptom, but is a very prominent and common symptom for people with ataxia. So a medication um, which is commonly used as a potential uh, treatment for gait disorders in ataxia is amantadine, and amantadine can have a stimulant effect, and sometimes we take advantage of that when people are really struggling with fatigue or really having problems um, with uh, cognition. And so being mindful that, that sometimes uh, a medication like amantadine might have more than one effect, um, it's a uh, worth trying if your um, uh, provider agrees with a, a trial of that medication. Stimulant medications such as methylphenidate, which is Ritalin, or dexamphetamine, such as Adderall, can also be helpful, but there can be side effects of these medications in terms of impaired appetite and um, effect on the heart, as well as blood pressure, and so it's very important to make sure you trial these medications only with supervision of a, a providing physician who's monitoring these parameters to make sure that there are no complicated side effects. Next slide, Burrs. So mood is very, very important in terms of addressing with uh, people who have ataxia. Depression can be a manifestation of the condition itself, or depression can be secondary in terms of adjustment to the diagnosis and to loss. Loss is a, a big feature of um, these conditions and these disorders, and I know a lot of people struggle significantly with loss associated with diagnosis. Again, um, making sure that there are not other conditions which are mimicking depression or a, a secondary causes of depression is very important. Making sure you're getting enough sleep. And then in terms of treatments for depression and anxiety, there are a number of medications which can be helpful for that, including um, medications such as SSRIs, those medications are um, medications like Prozac or sertraline. Um, SSNRIs, uh, one of which I like a lot, it's called duloxetine. And the, um, I use that medication especially because it has a separate indication for pain. And many people that have ataxia also have pain and struggle with chronic pain, nerve type pain. And so it's very important um, to uh, think about the additional effects when selecting medications for treatment. Therapy and counseling is very important. Um, there has been uh, studies looking at mindfulness and meditation as treatments for anxiety, which have been shown to be helpful. And then obviously participating in support groups um, like the NAF can be very helpful in terms of people feeling like they're not alone or the caregivers are not alone when struggling with a chronic condition. Now, when there are refractory mental health symptoms, such as psychosis or refractory depression, it's very important to have a psychiatrist involved for medication management for that. And so um, want to make sure that people are, are uh, not only relying on their primary care physician or their neurologist, and when um, depression is not responding or anxiety disorders are not responding, then seeing a psychiatrist is very important to help address those. And, um, medications such as antipsychotics, um, such as risperidone, can be helpful in managing refractory depression or even... In terms of nystagmus and double vision, um, nystagmus is the jumping of the eyes. And sometimes this happens in people in primary gaze where at all times their eyes are jumping either horizontally um, or vertically. And sometimes nystagmus is triggered by an eye movement, such as looking to the side um, or in a direction, and then it may stabilize when um, the vision is held there for a period of time. There are a number of medications um, which anecdotally can be useful for nystagmus, and, and Dr. Seberger mentioned one of these, um, the formenopyridine and the acetazolamide. There are a number of other medications which there may be case reports for, or um, people may have um, empiric uh, evidence for, meaning um, experiential evidence for. Uh, the neuro-ophthalmologists that we work with here um, have recommended for a number of patients trial of amantadine. Again, this medication can be useful for a variety of 
um, symptoms associated with ataxia, and gabapentin can also be helpful. The issue with gabapentin, however, in terms of side effects, is that for some people it can exacerbate ataxia, and fatigue is a very common side effect for this. Um, I've had a few patients who also feel that it exacerbates dizziness and vertigo, and so in terms of the benefit versus the potential side effect, those things have to be weighed uh, against what's more useful. Vestibular rehab may also be helpful because the cerebellum controls the eyes, and so for this and for double vision, uh, a rehab program focusing on um, the connection between the cerebellum and the eyes can be helpful. In terms of double vision, prisms or special lenses may be prescribed by an ophthalmologist or a neuro-ophthalmologist who specializes in eye movement disorders. Patching can sometimes be helpful, um, and a lot of times people figure that out in terms of if they're having double vision on their own, where if they close one eye, it makes the double vision resolve. And then occasionally for severe refractory cases where the vision is interfering so much with function that it is um, an individual is unable to function and patching is insufficient, botulinum toxin injections to the extraocular muscles may be helpful for interfering with the movement of the eyes to stabilize them in a, in a um, particular uh, location. Okay, dizziness and vertigo um, are common symptoms for people who are struggling with ataxia. For people who have a positional component to their vertigo, such as a head position, which seems to trigger um, vertigo, that is really important to avoid the triggering position. And that, that seems kind of obvious, but it may take a little while to figure out what those triggering positions are. Alcohol can exacerbate dizziness and vertigo, and so it is very, very important to avoid alcohol as a treatment for dizziness and vertigo. You don't want to do something that's going to make it worse, and so alcohol can do that, so it's important to avoid it. Many medications have side effects of dizziness and vertigo, and so when there is a symptom presenting, one of the first things that I do is look at the medication list and see, are any of the medications that are being prescribed associated with dizziness and vertigo um, to make sure that if that medication is not necessary, we can, re we can eliminate it or maybe substitute it with a different medication which may not have that side effect. In terms of treatments for dizziness and vertigo, um, there are a couple of different things which are non-medication approaches which can certainly be explored and occasionally be helpful. Um, benefit is there's minimal side effect or risk to these as opposed to the medications. So some people will try these motion sickness bracelets, which have these pr um, pressure points on the wrist. These are acupressure points, and the idea is that by putting pressure there, it can reduce um, vertigo as a symptom. Uh, may not be very effective for, for some people, but again, in terms of the risk-benefit ratio, it's a very, very low-risk intervention. The Epley maneuver is something that um, can be performed in the clinic by a, by a provider. Um, sometimes people look this up online too and try it on their own. And what the Epley maneuver is, is a, a maneuver where um, in the semicircular canals in the vestibular system, uh, if a little bit of the structure of what's called an otolith, it's this little stone in there that floats around and stimulates the nerve cells to tell your brain where your head is in space, if a little piece of that gets dislodged and is stimulating, then it can cause vertigo and, and be very, very disconcerting. Um, paroxysmal vertigo is thought to be related to that condition. And so the Epley maneuver is a, a way to try to dislodge a little piece of that um, otolith that might have broken off. Again, minimal risk to this and can be performed in the clinic as well. Vestibular rehab may be helpful for dizziness and vertigo. And again, uh, there are physical therapists, usually within this section of audiology, um, who can be um, skilled in doing this and in um, at least a trial of uh, vestibular therapy for people who are suffering from these symptoms. A list of medications is on the slide, including medications um, which have already been talked about for other treatments. One of the medications which can be fairly helpful is clonazepam. However, clonazepam can exacerbate ataxia. And so for any of these medications, when trying them, it's really important to understand that there are other potential side effects. And so making sure that you're being mindful of those and talking about them with a physician who is familiar with the side effect profile before trying any of these. For example, scopolamine, um, which can be done as a transdermal patch, can be very helpful. It's a medication commonly prescribed for motion sickness. People often use it before going on boats. 
However, scopolamine can have side effects of interfering with bladder emptying and causing cognitive impairments. And so understanding what the side effect profile of any of these medications is, is, is vital before embarking on a trial. Next slide. Speech and swallowing. Speech and swallowing are very important symptoms to manage, and, and these symptoms can be managed. Um, speech is important in terms of the ability to communicate with others, and this is, can be a very debilitating symptom. Swallowing is vital. If you cannot swallow or you choke, that can be life-ending. And I take swallowing impairments very, very, very serious with my patients. I spend a lot of time talking about them and exploring them. And it's important to identify because these are modifiable factors. Speech therapy um, can be helpful for uh, speech disorders, including working on articulation and volume issues. But the other thing is that assisted augmentative communication devices can be very, very helpful in terms of allowing people to communicate with um, other modalities uh, to allow people ways to communicate besides just spoken words. Many people will do this already where they'll maybe text on their phone um, or uh, use an iPad in terms of texting with large buttons when people are having a lot of difficulty understanding them. But there are even more um, sophisticated programs and devices which can even use eye gaze as a way to select and um, uh, words and phrases in order to be able to communicate with somebody. And so when people are having a lot of difficulty with spoken language, um, you shouldn't assume that there's nothing that can be done about it. And working with a speech therapist, especially someone who's familiar with AAC or augmented, assisted augmented communication is really important. In terms of swallowing function, seeing a, a speech therapist who is familiar with swallowing function or an OT who's familiar with swallowing function, function is vital. And the things that they talk about is making sure you have appropriate head position over your body and that you have your chin tucked a little bit as opposed to turning off to the side, which makes it more difficult to swallow. That your body position is also appropriate, that you're not slumped over, if at all possible, that your torso is upright to allow gravity to help and that there's not any kinks in the esophagus as things are trying to go down. You shouldn't be multitasking when you are trying to eat and swallow. So this means not talking, not laughing, not being distracted by something else, and that it's important to take very small bites and have a sip of a liquid available if you're having trouble getting that bite to go down. When people are having difficulty, modifying textures is very, very important. People often will do this on their own, but it's something that I certainly ask about and, and um, that the speech therapist will also assess for in terms of what kind of difficulties people are having with various textures. And then using a straw to modify the volume of thin liquids can be very helpful where you don't get too large of amount of a liquid in your mouth and then have difficulty with it going down where people are then coughing and choking. Straws also come in different sizes and the smaller the straw, the less amount of volume that gets through. And so that is an easy way to control the amount of volume that's coming into your mouth as opposed to with a cup where if you have a tremor or an a, a, you know a movement which is interfering with your ability to control it that way, it can be very problematic. For people whose swallowing is not safe, it is important to discuss not only modifying the texture of the foods using thickeners when necessary, but also whether a nasogastric tube or a gastrostomy tube would be important to consider as a treatment option to provide safe nutrition and as a way to provide medications. A lot of people feel like a gastrostomy tube or a G-tube is giving in, um, but I have patients who still eat and take uh, pleasure in eating, but are not able to meet their nutritional needs by oral eating alone. And so we have a gastrostomy tube placed to provide the nutritional needs, provide the needs for liquids, and for easier administration of medications. Sleep apnea and respiratory control is another common symptom associated with ataxia. Um, if someone is obese, then discussing weight loss um, for obstructive apnea is important, but figuring out what kind of apnea it is is also very important because many um, disorders associated with uh, ataxias have central apnea, which means there's a loss of control of the brain in terms of controlling the ability to breathe. 
And so understanding if it's a, 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 a obstructive apnea where it's a mechanical problem versus a um, central apnea where it's a problem coming from the brain stem and the cerebellum in terms of control of breathing versus the combination of the two is very important because therapy is then guided towards that. Things that suppress respiratory control or lower tone in the throat um, and the tongue, such as alcohol, benzodiazepines like Valium or clonazepam, or respiratory suppressants such as opioids should be avoided if possible, especially before bedtime. During the day, speech therapy can work on um, diaphragmatic support for breath control, but at night, supplemental oxygen via nasal cannula might be helpful. And for people that have more severe forms of apnea, CPAP or BiPAP can be very helpful. I think it's really important not to underestimate the lack of what um, uh, sleep apnea can do in terms of symptoms of lack of sleep, even if people feel like they're getting enough sleep. If you're waking up at night repeatedly because you cannot breathe, it really, really disrupts your sleep and can make your symptom of ataxia worse during the daytime. This is a treatable and a modifiable factor and for any patient that is having difficulty with daytime fatigue, I always, always order a sleep study because I've had patients who have had a significant improvement in their daytime symptoms of cognitive impairment, mood, fatigue, and even ataxia, even balance when we treat their underlying sleep apnea. And so it's important to recognize this, ask about it, and get it treated. For people that are having paradoxical closure of their vocal cords or strider, which is interfering with their ability to breathe at night. This happens with multiple system atrophy. Botulinum toxin injections to the vocal cords can be given. And if necessary, a tracheostomy can provide an alternative airway for people where it is um, unresponsive to the above measures. There are some interesting work looking at um, nerve stimulators and diaphragmatic pacers for people who are having difficulty with respiratory control. And um, that may also be an option for people who are having refractory um, problems with their respiratory control. Next slide. Tremors. Tremors are a very common symptom in people with ataxia. Occupational therapists can be really helpful for finding adaptations for tremors and finding ways to accommodate daily function. Sometimes things like a slant board that you write on to change the position of your arm. Um, people often find that um, a bracing can be helpful, bracing on something. Um, and then adaptations such as wrist or ankle weights to reduce tremor, um, it can be helpful for some people. Uh, there are weighted or adaptive utensils. So weighted utensils are heavier utensils and adaptive utensils have larger grips. And then there are self-stabilizing or smart utensils such as liftware or um, gyno, which uh, are, are um, responding to the tremor to try to cancel it out, making it easier to self-feed. Occasionally, when there is a dystonic component to the tremor and it's really pulling in one direction. Focal botulinum toxin injections can be helpful. Um, there are a number of medications which I'm gonna review on uh, a slide whenever it comes up. Um, uh, and then deep brain stimulation surgery, as Dr. Seberger mentioned, can be helpful for refractory tremor. Next slide. These are medications which can be helpful for tremor. Um, many of these medications are used for essential tremor, uh, and these medications um, may have primary uh, indications separate than tremor. In fact, all of them have primary indications that are different, but might be useful to explore. So amantadine, again, comes up on this list. Gabapentin, again, comes up on this list. But then there are other medications which you may not typically think of um, being associated uh, or typically think of as medications being used to treat tremor, such as carbidopa levodopa or cinemat. This is the medication most commonly used to treat Parkinson's disease. And it can be helpful for tremor and Parkinson's disease in some patients. But in terms of um, medication options, this medication does not tend to be as sedating as a number of other medications on this list. Um, although it may affect blood pressure in some people, and so it's still important to think about from a side effect profile. But there are a number of medications which can be trialed for tremor. The problem with these medications and all medications for hyperkinetic movement disorders is they may diminish the um, frequency of the tremor or the amplitude of the tremor, but they may not take it away completely. And so even with the medication, if it, if it does have some benefit, it may not be as much benefit as um, is needed to translate into a functional improvement. Next slide. 
Dystonia is a twisting posture or a twisting movement. It's commonly associated with a number of neurodegenerative disorders. Um, bracing such as orthotics can sometimes be helpful if the dystonia is not severe, and that can provide a mechanical um, way to prevent the twisting from happening, but sometimes also can um, have an alleviating maneuver or what's called a sensory trick to interfere uh, with the dystonia itself. Botulinum toxins can be helpful. Sometimes people find benefit from um, massage, heat, or hydrotherapy, so warm water therapy, uh, especially for the pain that can be associated with dystonia. And then there are a whole host of medications which can be used for treatment of dystonia. Again, none of them um, uh, will take away all of the dystonia when it is a severe case, um, but there are a number of medications which can be trialed. On this list, I did put second tier behind a number of medications um, because of the concern about potential side effects. So for example, dantrolene and tizanidine can be very effective medications for dystonia, but they can have significant effects on the liver, which need to be monitored, and therefore I would not consider them first tier medications. Um, phenobarbital is a medication I frequently use for refractory dystonia in pediatric patients, but it can be very, very sedating. And so again, it's not a medication that I would think of as a first tier medication for treatment of dystonia. Next slide. Spasticity is um, different from dystonia in that it's not necessarily a twisting posture, but it is that stiffness and tightness and resistance to movement in a limb. Um, many people suffer from this. It can manifest also with clonus, which is a jumping movement of a limb that can happen um, when it's positioned in a certain way, um, such as with uh, the ankle um, dorsiflexed or moved up that can elicit clonus that only resolves when you let the pressure off the ankle or if you straighten out the leg a little bit if it's happening at the knee. Um, for spasticity that is uncomfortable, massage heat, again, hydrotherapy can be helpful. Botulinum toxin injections can be helpful. And then medications where there's actually quite a bit of good evidence and has been developed for this are medications like baclofen and diazepam. Second tier medications can include dantrolene and tizanidine. And in the pediatric patients, I've been using cyproheptadine or periactin, which is primarily used as a motility agent or for pediatric migraine. It's in the antihistamine category of medications, um, but there is a separate indication for this for spinal cord spasticity. And so I've been trying that a little bit in some of my patients who are refractory to other medications. Intrathecal baclofen or baclofen that is administered directly onto the spinal cord via a pump with a tunneled catheter underneath the skin and then it's infused directly onto the spinal cord it can be helpful for refractory um, spasticity. And then in the pediatric population and in young adults, selective dorsal rhizotomy is a surgery to cut some of the sensory nerve roots as a way to interrupt the spastic loop that is happening as a reflex. Um, and we offer that um, in some young adults uh, at Children's where I work as a palliative option for people where um, they've been refractory to all other treatments for spasticity and when it's uncomfortable and interfering with seating in a wheelchair. Next slide. Pain is a common complaint. Um, it's really, really important not to miss other causes of pain. And so um, I've had some patients who have come in complaining of back pain and it turns out they have compression fractures. And it's important to recognize those because there's a completely different treatment for compression factors than there are for other types of pain. And so making sure that you're not assuming it's just related to a neurodegenerative disorder and not evaluating for other causes such as orthopedic causes. A pain psychologist can be helpful for coping and cognitive behavioral therapy can, very, can be very helpful too for, for coping with pain and living with chronic pain. Pain can manifest also with increasing anxiety and depression. And so making sure that you're not ignoring that that can be secondary to pain and that can be exacerbating the pain itself is very important. Um, Non-medication approaches shouldn't be ignored. Again, massage, um, heat or cold therapy, hydrotherapy, biofeedback and physical therapy can be very important. Acupuncture or acupressure can be very helpful. And again, minimal side effects in terms of affecting other body systems. There is actually some benefit in pain for, with focal botulinum toxin as well, not just for the movement piece because it can affect sensory nerve endings as well. And then for some patients where they have failed medications, um, a spinal cord or peripheral nerve stimulator can be helpful and is usually um, 
uh, thought of when people go see a pain specialist, um, a pain management specialist, if medications aren't helpful. Don't forget about topical my medications. There are um, uh, prescription ones like Voltaren gel or diclofenac for orthopedic type pain. And then there are a number of other topical administrations of medications which can be helpful for muscle type pain. Um, there are a whole host of medications that can be used for pain. Again, I mentioned duloxetine previously, also known as Cymbalta, which can be very helpful for nerve pain. It has a separate FDA in a, uh, approval for pain and can be a very useful medication which may not have some of the same sedating side effects that gabapentin has or the weight gain um, effects that uh, pregabalin or Lyrica can have. Um, important to remember that narcotic medications can cause respiratory suppression and so um, in general would avoid those unless absolutely necessary. Next slide. Restless leg symptoms occur um, in association with ataxias. It's really important to make sure that primary causes of restless leg are being evaluated for and treated. So iron deficiency, diabetes, kidney failure, and peripheral neuropathy can all have um, restless leg as a symptom or masquerade as restless leg. Specific medications um, and substances can also exacerbate these types of symptoms. So anti-nausea medications, some antidepressants, Antipsychotics or even antihistamines can do this. And so recognizing that these are contributing um, if uh, the restless leg symptoms are severe is important. And then eliminating things that can exacerbate the restless legs such as tobacco, alcohol, and caffeine. Some non-medication approaches to treating restless leg include massages, hot baths, heat or ice, and there's a vibrating pad called Relaxis. Um, that some people may find helpful in terms of um, interfering with those restless leg symptoms. Medications approved for the treatment of restless leg um, include um, dopamine agonists like Pramipexol or Mirapex, Rapinarol or Requip, and Ritigatine or Nupro. Um, some people may also find benefit from Carbidopa or Levodopa, which is Cinemat. But a, a word of caution about the dopamine agonists like Pramipexol and Rapinarol, um, they can be associated with sleep attacks, and so it's really important to monitor for sudden sleep onset. If you're taking these medications, we certainly wouldn't want you to fall asleep while driving. Diazepam or clonazepam can also be helpful for restless leg, but may make ataxia symptoms worse. And so it's important to counterbalance those two things. And then other medications like carbamazepine, tegretol, or pregabalin, uh, which, are, uh, which were originally developed as um, uh, seizure medications or to affect the GABA system can also be helpful. Some patients do find um, narcotic pain medications helpful, uh, but again, I've mentioned this uh, numerous times before, use those with caution. Next slide. Um, urinary urgency and incontinence is a very important symptom and is a common symptom associated with ataxia. Um, so one of the first things to do is to reduce bladder irritants, which can make urgency and incontinence more, more likely or more common. It includes eliminating a lot of things that make life good, like carbonated beverages, caffeine, alcohol, chocolate, chili peppers, etc. Artificial sweeteners and large doses of vitamin C can also make this worse, and, and citrus too. So if you've eliminated those things, um, the other thing then to look at is um, other medical conditions which can make urgency and incontinence more common. Urinary tract infections, constipation, prostatic hypertrophy, um, prolapse, which is especially common in women who are, um, have had children, um, a, a bladder outlet obstruction or diabetes can also manifest with these symptoms. So making sure that you're not just assuming it's related to the ataxia and screening for these other things is really important. And then looking at medications which can make it worse, such as blood pressure medications, muscle relaxants, or sedatives. In terms of non-medication approaches, um, frequent or timed voiding, uh, using pads, um, pee panties, which are primarily marketed to the uh, to women, uh, but thinks is a brand of this, um, or adult diapers can be helpful for um, uh, uh, absorbing urine when it escapes. Pelvic floor therapy to strengthen the muscles to help um, prevent the bladder from relaxing can be a very effective therapy. People think of this as kegels, but there are other types of pelvic floor therapy as well. And for um, patients who are refractory to those interventions, um, a urologist can do botulinum 
toxin injections um, to the bladder to help the bladder relax so that it's not overactive. Percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation is um, a type of stimulation to a sensory nerve in the foot, and this is based on acupuncture techniques. Can be mildly helpful for some people. Again, minimal side effects to it. And then there are a whole number of medications which can be used and are prescribed by a urologist to help the bladder relax. Um, but it's important to remember that some of those medications can have anticholinergic side effects and to understand what that means in terms of affecting memory. The last condition that I'm going to talk about is sexual function um, before we turn it over to Dr. Hawkins. Um, sexual function can be a, a problem with aging. It can also be a problem with ataxia disorders. Um, re recognizing uh, other medical conditions which can contribute and treating them in the long term is very important. So treating hypertension and heart disease, um, high cholesterol and diabetes as a long-term way to preserve, se preserve sexual function is, is, is really necessary. And then recognizing low testosterone in men when present can be helpful. Um, reducing stress, reducing alcohol and tobacco, and medications such as SSRIs or propranolol, which can interfere with erectile dysfunction, um, may be helpful as well in terms of addressing sexual dysfunction. Treating depression, treating anxiety, and addressing any relationship factors which are contributing to sexual function problems um, is necessary as well. And then making sure for women that there's adequate lubrication and estrogen creams can be very helpful to treat a thinning um, vaginal tissue post-menopause. For men who are having difficulty achieving erectile dysfunction, sorry, achieving, achieving erections and for whom medications for erectile dysfunction are not indicated, using a vacuum pump to draw blood into the penis and then a flexible silicone ring at the base of the penis um, to prevent that blood from escaping can be helpful for getting an erection and maintaining it. Uh, there are a number of medications which are used for erectile dysfunction. Um, common ones that are known are sildenafil or Viagra or tadaf tad sorry, Tadalafil or Cialis. Um, but again, these medications can have potential side effects, and it's important to make sure that um, there's not a lot, a, lot of, a lot of underlying heart disease or hypertension um, because um, if that's what's interfering with sexual function, you want to make sure that you're addressing that from a medical standpoint before taking a medication which might make engaging in um, sexual activity risky. So those are all the slides that I have, and I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Hawkins now to talk about medical marijuana and CBD. All right, everybody. So thanks for sticking with us, and we're going to kind of switch gears a little bit here to talk about a topic now, that's certainly gained a lot of interest uh, locally here in Colorado, but definitely nationally and internationally as well, and that's cannabis. And today I'm going to focus mostly on um, to talking and discussing about it in, in relationship to the ataxia disorders. So at kind of the first half of the talk, we're going to review a lot of the terminology for cannabis and the cannabis medical products, talk a little bit about the endocannabinoid system, which is how it interacts within our bodies, and then do a brief touch on the research that's currently undergoing that's specific to ataxia. And then the second half of the talk, I'm really going to get into a lot of the possible benefits and side effects similar to what Dr. Collins was just mentioning um, and where you might fit cannabis into treating those symptoms. And then, uh, and then how does that actually happen? So what are some kind of practical uh, tips as you kind of think about use of these in the actual real world setting? So I do want to kind of have a couple disclaimers. So please, please, please consult your local laws. That could be either at your actual jobs or institutions or state level, federal level, et cetera regarding any possible restrictions and regulations, because it does vary place to place. Um, <clears throat> there are no discussions of any non-US FDA approved products. So those are the only ones that are directly discussed in this one. And then everything in here refers to medicinal use of these products and not really regarding recreational. So kind of getting into it. So what is cannabis? So cannabis is the actual name of the plant. And there's kind of two big subtypes of it, sativa and indica and you can see in the picture on the right. And then hemp is kind of a lower THC content version of cannabis sativa. And we know that it contains dozens, if not hundreds, if not more active chemical compounds in the plant itself that can interact in our minds and body. But probably the two to kind of separate from the herd and take a special note of is THC, which is tetrahydrocannabinol. And that is, this is the psychoactive component of marijuana or cannabis that gives you that feeling of high, of euphoria. 
And the other ones are the cannabidiols, which are CBD in a very close um, relationship with cannabinols, or just goes by CBN. Uh, I'm gonna be referring mostly for this talk as that group together as CBD. These are ones that have gained a lot of interest in terms of their potential of interacting medicinally within our minds and bodies, but have little to no psychoactive potential. And you'll see that a lot of products that you view out there will oftentimes comment on how much THC and how much CBD they have in them. So those are really the two to pay attention to. So to kind of talk a little bit about how they interact in, in our bodies, so endocannabinoids are chemical messengers that our body makes endogenously or within ourselves called neurotransmitters. And you can kind of see in the cartoon blown up here how they have these little discrete molecules that are kind of going back and forth between the neurons. And those are the nerve cells in the brain. And they can actually kind of talk back to each other. So there's a kind of constant give and take. You can almost imagine that our brain kind of is a bunch of computers all networked together and they're sending those discrete messages back and forth. So think about them almost like emails being sent back and forth. And those are the chemical molecules, the neurotransmitters that provide that. So where do the endocannabinoids get their name is because they're very similar to the cannabis products and the cannabinoids and that we mentioned previously. And so the cannabinoids that you can take interact in the, within two sub, subtypes called the CB1 and CB2 systems. And they can be kind of found throughout the body but you can see for purposes of today, we're gonna to focus mostly on effects in the brain. So you can see the yellow part back here, the cerebellum that we mentioned, the kind of purplish part, which is our limbic system here, which houses a lot of mood and memory, uh, the brain stem area, which houses a lot of functions like vision and others. And then even throughout the cortex, cortex itself, which controls movement, sensation, pain, et cetera. So why is this important? Because this is really where the research has gone so far in ataxia, and here's just a sampling have recent papers that have come out kind of examining how these endocannabinoid systems are present specifically within ataxia diseases. And we've gained some knowledge about you know, whether or not these are present in either animal models or certainly in actual autopsy data from patients that have suffered from diseases like spinal ciliary ataxia type 3. So what do we know? So when you kind of divide it up between the CB1 and CB2, well, we know that CB1 is kind of found normally throughout the whole brain, specifically within the actual neurons themselves. Whereas CB2 is actually found in the immune system and peripherally and in the brain, it's actually found in the support immune cells of the brain called the microglia. We know that from these studies that I mentioned previously, that there is CB1 is present in the cerebellar neurons and in a lot of the other important brain structures that are affected by the diseases in ataxia. We know that CB2, interestingly, is showing some evidence that even though it's not normally found directly in the cerebellar neurons, it can change in certain disease states. So we know that both CB1 and CB2 can actually go alter or alter in, in different changes within the systems when they're in these different types of ataxia. So, and then also interestingly of note, when you think about taking any of the cannabis products, we know that THC interacts directly with CB1. We know that CBN, the cannabinols, interact with CB2. And CBD kind of has this augmenting or smoothing out. You can almost think of it as like a dimmer switch where it can kind of control and augment the activity of these different systems. So certainly um, all the products that we're kind of discussing probably interact meaningfully in the CB1, CB2. So in terms of ataxia, really what we kind of are aware of is that these receptors in this system is showing up in the places where the disease is occurring and, and all going, undergoing changes. So it does provide a very interesting target for further research and investigation for possible treatments and intervention. But here's a, kind of an example of what we don't know yet. So there's still a lot to be worked out. And as one example, the CB1, when you directly activate it or stimulate it, can have different effects if you do it acutely. We know from numerous studies, including the ones I mentioned and going back many, many years, that even in healthy subjects, if you stimulate CB1, that it can actually cause ataxia and certainly would worsen ataxia if you already had it as an underlying issue. But the question mark is really kind of in the second part, which is if you stimulate it chronically, and there was some evidence in some animal models and other places, that can actually provide neuroprotective effects. And so what exactly is chronic stimulation is really still left to be kind of worked out as far as how much and how long and might overcome the acute worsening and lead to actual possible uh, benefits. So we still have no real idea about um, what these are, but this illustrates at least kind of the complexity that it's not just straightforward 
um, stimulation. So kind of summarizing, you know, what's the state of research, especially as it applies to ataxia? We're lost in the weeds. We can certainly see that something in the distance is very interesting, but we haven't quite figured out yet um, how to kind of put it all together. So right now there's more questions than answers, and there's certainly a lot of mixed data, like I just mentioned about what exactly we should do to intervene in these systems. And quite frankly, there's just no high quality human studies in ataxia to kind of look at any possible effects from taking any of the cannabis products directly in terms of how it might affect ataxia. So that's kind of the first half of the talk where we kind of release review the terminology and where we're at with research. But the second half, I wanted to kind of shift gears and say, if you're interested in starting these products, how can you really approach that? So the questions, just like Dr. Collins was mentioning, of course, first and foremost, you always want to kind of say to yourself, what am I trying to make better? So what's the benefit I'm going after? And that's always going to be weighed against the possible side effects. Now, what's important to kind of keep in mind when you're thinking about cannabis products is what is the THC and CBD components? What's the ratio in which one you might kind of be targeting for your individual symptoms? And then also there's many different formulations or how you can take the cannabis products. And so it's important to kind of keep in mind some, some tips about what might work for what conditions you're trying to treat. Um, can't stress this enough. It's very, very important to let your physicians know they're going to be attempting to use any of these products because there are definitely known drug-drug interactions that might have to change their effective dosing. So at least at that baseline, they should be aware. But oftentimes they can definitely review with you, just like Dr. Collins went through the multiple options that are available for treatment of the symptoms and kind of walk through the possible benefits and side effects of each consideration. So what are the kind of benefits that we're aware of? Well, here's kind of the FDA approved ones that we know about. And we know that for anorexia, which is lack of appetite, especially in HIV AIDS patients, um, chemotherapy for cancer patients where they get a lot of nausea or upset stomach. And then in childhood epilepsy syndromes, all have FDA approved cannabis products. The uh, top four that you see there um, are all synthetic THC. So this is kind of a synthetic mimic of the THC. And Epidolex is actually a plant-derived product that's similar to the CBD. So kind of a mixture of, of where it can go. So kind of tying it back into what's really important for a lot of the ataxia patients, you know, here are some symptoms that can improve. And I think it's important to stress here that not these are not FDA approved indications where they're starred. So we already mentioned about the appetite and nausea, but getting into more specific things, anxiety, the insomnia or difficulty falling asleep, spasticity like Dr. Collins mentioned, which is the tightness in the muscles, and then certainly kind of chronic pain, as Dr. Collins also illustrated. Now, all these things would potentially be a reason to consider um, use of cannabis products because there's evidence in other diseases um, or anecdotally that it can help individual patients. But that's always going to be balanced against what can get worse. And again, I can't highlight enough that be very cautious about balance and, and walking in the ataxia itself getting worse and leading to more falls. I mentioned about that CB1 system simulation, and so we know that it definitely has a profound effect there. The next four are kind of the THC ones, and these are your psychoactive ones. So thinking about cognition and memory, we know that short-term use leads to decreased concentration, short-term memory lapses. The long-term complications of that is still trying to be understood. There's some emerging evidence that especially younger patients in that brain development phase, like teenagers, adolescents, um, use during those years may actually cause long-term consequences. So there's still some investigation that needs to be figured out as far as how exactly that occurs. Now, another thing to kind of keep in mind is when you're trying to address anxiety, you always have the chance of overcorrecting and leading to apathy or loss of motivation and, or causing depression. And in some cases, you can have the quote unquote bad trip phenomenon where you can get actual worsening of anxiety and that can lead to paranoia. And the worst kind of at the end of the spectrum would be hallucinations or, or frank psychosis as well. And most of these are kind of transient while the medications are on, but sometimes long term use can lead to more permanent states of affairs. Nausea and dry mouth are other ones to kind of keep in mind that can get worse, and addiction in a small subset of patients, especially with, with high THC products. And an important note, and this is the FDA and other groups have kind of illustrated this, 
There's possible changes during fetal development with use of these. A lot of that's been looked at, either marijuana, which includes the THC. So there's really not great data that kind of separates out THC and CBD in terms of safety. So I think it's important to keep in mind and probably recommended to avoid use during pregnancy or during breastfeeding with either of these products. We do know that both THC and CBD can um, get into the fetus during pregnancy and also um, be in the breast milk too. So that we do know that they can be transmitted um, through those mechanisms. So kind of summarizing it, you know, what's the good and the bad about THC versus CBD as you kind of consider that question of which one to kind of consider for your treatment. THC has more potential benefit for the majority of the symptoms that we mentioned and really is the only one that has a lot of appetite stimulation with it. That's weighed against those psychoactive side effects and certainly the motor side effects such as worsening of the ataxia. The CBD, on the other hand, avoids a lot of the potential for the psychoactive side effects, but also may have less actual benefit for treatment of the symptoms. So it's kind of more benign on both fronts. And I like to make a special note because it's becoming increasingly clear in a lot of our trials looking at CBD for other conditions that the oil itself, similar to if you were to ingest oils for any other reason, can really cause loose stools and diarrhea. So it's important to keep in mind as you consider formulations. So just to kind of talk, talk base, touch base a little bit about how this gets presented on many of the product labels. Oftentimes they're labeled as the ratio of CBD to THC or vice versa. So you can see a 20 to one, a one to one, 50 to one, et cetera. It's important to keep in mind that that doesn't actually reflect the, the true strength of the amount of each of those components. Many of them will not contain that information. And even if it does, Beware, because the, the bottom line is the packaging oftentimes can be inaccurate and we don't really know how much is in these products because they're made from a various uh, different techniques and places, dispensaries, et cetera. So you have to always be, uh, be extra careful about um, trusting what they say on the packaging. The other thing to keep in mind is that even if it says pure CBD or CBD only, if you're trying to avoid those THC side effects, that's often a misnomer and almost all products will contain some level of THC. It's just a matter of what the actual strength is in those products. Um, lastly, I think kind of summing up the different formulations, you know, I have a bunch of pictures here, but there is, I think that article that I found says it all. There's 24 ways to consume marijuana, smoking edibles, lotions, and more. So there's many, many different variations of all of these. And I think that when you're trying to kind of size up, well, what's the best way to take these? There's a few key principles. So Dr. Collins talked a little bit about like within the pain, you know, the difference between using topical agents to relieve pain versus having to take systemic medications. And I think that's very much applies here. You can use an, a topical salve or cream or ointment that might have THC in it, um, and you can get away without it causing as much side effects because not much of it's getting up to the brain to cause those psychoactive effects. Whereas if you're trying to use it for anxiety or insomnia, a topical treatment is probably not gonna work because you need a systemic one that can get up to the brain you know, to provide the, the proper benefit. But that does come at risk of inducing some of the side effects. So it's important to kind of think about what, what those might be and how to use them for the individual indications. Um, I like to kind of briefly mention about the edibles. There's kind of two big issues here. So there's delayed effects with them. Um, whenever you're ingesting things, there's a lot of variability about how quickly it can get digested and into the bloodstream. And we see many, many patients with accidental overdoses of these when they uh, continue to take them thinking they haven't gotten an effect yet and they haven't waited long enough, and then all of a sudden the higher dose hits them altogether. So it's important to watch out for that. I like how this the chocolate chip cookie example for edibles, because if you think about the chocolate chips as the actual active ingredient in it, be it THC, CBD, or both, you can have one cookie that has a lot of them, you can have one cookie that has none, or half of a cookie that has all of it, and the other half doesn't. So especially if you're using edibles and chopping them up or taking pieces and parts of them, they're very, very infrequently truly homogenous, meaning that every piece is going to be the same strength. So you might get different concentrations at different parts of it. So be extra careful uh, for use of medicinal purposes for those. And then finally, the inhaled versions, anything that goes into the lungs. So this is the vape pens, the rolling paper, cigarettes, all those kinds of things and different ways of doing it. What we don't really understand yet is what's the long-term consequences of inhaling the, the, through the lungs. So there's still a lot to be worked out in terms of what the actual risks are there. So certainly if anyone has already an underlying 
uh, lung issues or pulmonary issues, be extra careful. But that is something that I think is a very reasonable discussion to have with your individual physicians. So kind of last but not least, I'd like to kind of talk about what's the current state of the real world and give you some rules of the road that I try to give most of my patients when we have these discussions. Number one is you get buyer beware. So again, unlike a lot of the medications that Dr. Collins was able to talk about that have very discreet doses to them, these aren't typically prescribed. And even if you try to do your best to prescribe it, there's really no oversight to these individual products. So the dosing, even on the label, can be highly variable as actually to what's in them. So I always say, start low and go slow. Always give it the benefit of doubt that it's gonna be more potent than you expect. Even if you've used similar products in the past, when you're trying to switch over and start new ones, absolutely start at the lowest dose that they recommend and build up slowly to make sure that you're staying in the right benefit to risk ratio. The other important thing is trust and verify. So you can trust what the product says, but verify it first. And this is really, really important when you're even picking up a refill. Same place, same packaging, same everything could be very different from the previous one. So it's, it behaves very differently than a lot of like other prescription medications that are very much consistent from package to package. So you almost wanna go back and start over every time you're picking up a new batch or refill and give it that respect. So for example, you wouldn't wanna take some of these that can have potential psychoactive side effects like sedation right before you hop behind the wheel of a car or do anything else that would put you at risk. Um, so again, and I think it's important to kind of repeat those steps every time you're picking up even the same exact um, one they've used previously until you kind of know how it's going to affect you. And lastly, this kind of a tip about you know, testing and local laws, drug testing, even with the CBD only products will all test positive. So if you're using a cannabis product, you will test positive the majority of the time um, for any of the tests. So don't be caught um, asking for forgiveness, this is a time where you ask for permission. So be well aware for your jobs that if you're working with a pain clinic or other medical institutions where they're doing routine drug testing, let make sure they let them know and ask for permission that they're on board with you using these products. Don't assume that you'll be able to pass the test because almost all of them will come positive, even if it doesn't um, explicitly say it has THC in it. So with that, I think we can wrap up. Thank you everybody for listening and I think we can open it up to questions. Yes, uh, thank you all so much. We've gotten some great questions beforehand and you're also typing questions and sending them in as I speak. So thank you for those. Um, one of the questions is um, about stem cell therapy and I am gonna direct you to the NAF website. Uh, Dr. Perlman also discussed stem cell research at the time. Uh, right now, there are no stem cells that can fix the brain or improve ataxia symptoms, so that it's not um, it's not uh, recommended for people to go and have different types of stem cell therapies for treatment of ataxia at this time. Um, for Dr. Collins, um, this letter's from Michael. Thank you, Michael. Um, my daughter, who recently turned four, was diagnosed with episodic ataxia type 1 a few years ago. The origin was a, a de novo mutation. The question I'm constantly asking myself is how do I tell if the reason she's sleepy or clumsy or fill in the blanks? Is it because of this daughter, the disorder or because she's four? I struggle with this question in no small part. It's draining. How do I know how to determine when something's wrong and when she's just being a four-year-old? <laughs> that's, that's a challenging question. Um, and um, I think what, you know, what uh, is an issue here too is that, you know, her condition isn't occurring in a vacuum. She is a four-year-old with a medical condition who is going to respond and react to that medical condition. And so certainly a four-year-old can tantrum about something or not want to participate in something, um, but the medical condition can also make it harder for her to do things which might be easier for other children to participate in. And so I think separating out what's the condition and what's the four-year-old is gonna be super, super challenging because she is a four-year-old with the condition. And so um, the way that I would look at it is, is whatever you're seeing out of 
the realm of what you would expect for a typical child. If you have another typical child, you maybe have a point of reference. Uh, that being said, even typical children, there's a lot of variability from child to child. And so I think, um, you know, really having a discussion, if you can, with a provider who is familiar with the disease or the, the disorder and can really try to help you tease out which is the disorder, which is a reaction to the disorder or just her normal developmental stage um, so that you're not um, both, you know, overreacting uh, to four-year-old behaviors, but also that you're not overreacting to the condition. Um, a lot of times um, in families, there's one parent who tends to be the maximizer and one parent who tends to be the minimizer. Um, these sometimes go along gender roles, but not always. And so there can be a, some difficulty in, in terms of parenting a child with uh, a, a chronic disease or even any child um, where parents have a different approach to things. And so, you know, uh, a lot of kids with ataxia fall down. And the question of how do you respond to them falling down is important. Do you um, respond with, oh, you know, oh, you, you know, every time they fall down, which then sometimes they look to you, they respond, they start crying, versus do you reassure them and say, you're fine, get up, move on. Um, and both approaches can be appropriate. And I think it's important to understand um, the validity to both of those approaches but also to understand there's differencing in parenting styles and differences in terms of what a child individually will need for themselves. Um, there's no easy answer to this. Uh, I think um, if you are not finding helpful answers um, from your physician, um, then there certainly are other people you could talk to. Uh, sometimes physical therapists can be very, very helpful for providing some guidance with this. But I think most importantly, parents being, um, on accord with how you're going to manage the behaviors um, and behaviors that might be a reaction to symptoms is really important. It's not an easy task parenting in general, and then you know trying to figure out what's a condition and what's what's the child and what's the behavioral reaction to it is uh, even more uh, challenging. Okay, the next question, and we have quite a few. This one I'm just going to lump two questions together about 4AP. Um, so both Shannon and Christine write, so thank you for your questions. Um, so the first one is, I've tried 4AP about seven years ago for eye issues, should I try it again? And the other is, will 4AP help with SCA 3? So the answer to that question is, again, in consultation with your doc, um, you could certainly readdress the, the possibility of starting 4AP again for your eye issues, depending on what they are. And you saw there was quite a list of other options for eye issues that Dr. Collins spoke about. And then will it um, help SCA 3? Again, this is something that's currently in clinical trial. It's thought that perhaps the longer acting version will act um, better than the shorter acting. So we just await to see what those uh, show. But the trial will include SCAs of various types. Uh, one of the um, things that I want to mention, Lauren, um, is that the slides should be available, but also there is um, this medications for ataxia symptoms that might be backwards, but there is a list of medications um, for many of the symptoms that I discussed on the NAF website. So look to that as well. That's something you can print out and bring into your physician. That's perfect. Thank you so much. That helps a lot. Um, so this question is asking about can TMS be used with DBS system already in place for someone that has tremors? I don't know the answer to that. Dr. Hawkins? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think some of it would depend a little bit about where you're trying to stimulate to. There might yeah. be ways where you could do it in certain instances, but um, that would be something that I would have to kind of get clarity on before I yep. answer that definitively. Is the concern <laughs> about the... Um, the magnetic mm -hmm. stimulation affecting the electrode. Yeah, exactly. So we and we so do know that like MRIs are like when you're walking through the airport through the metal detectors and others, you know, very much can interfere with DBS. Um, so certainly there, it, depending on how exactly the TMS is set up, there is a possibility of that. Um, that would be something that yeah, certainly could be investigated you know, further. 
And um, Dr. Collins, you answered Mary's question, which was at the end of the presentation, could the slide regarding memory treatments be pulled up again? And so this full presentation will be available to you. And um, the next question is about, what about freezing while walking? So this person says that they're having difficulty initiating gait and making the, the legs continue to work. Dr. Hawkins? They're wondering about medications, perhaps. This is from Joni. Thank you, Joni. Yeah, so I think kind of echoing what we said before, um, certainly an investigation with your providers and neurologists will be interesting to kind of figure out what exactly is going on with the gait issues. In terms of it, like when we use that terminology ourselves as neurologists, when we refer to freezing of gait, very commonly that can be seen under the umbrella of Parkinsonism. And Parkinsonism does have a list of medications that can sometimes be useful as well. And so a lot of times we can borrow from those Parkinson medications like levodopa, for example, and oftentimes that can potentially be a benefit specifically for freezing. But there's other things that can also contribute to issues with gait issues. And so I think that there's importance to kind of investigate like Dr. Collins mentioned, making sure you're not missing other kind of low hanging fruit like strength issues, muscle loss, back issues, other things that can sometimes uh, make it appear similar to freezing the gait um, and have different kinds of treatments. Um, so William asks about um, the speakers addressing issues related to alcohol use as a cerebellar ataxia patient. Well, it, the general party line is if you have ataxia, and impairment of cerebellar function, you don't want to do anything that is going to further impair your cerebellar function or be a toxin to it in the long term. And alcohol is a, is a cerebellar toxin, and so that is the concern, is that it acutely can make your ataxia worse, um, uh, but in the long term, with chronic use of alcohol, it can um, accelerate um, uh, ataxia and this make the severity of it worse over time. And so um, generally there is um, no safe amount of alcohol for people that have ataxia in terms of it affecting the cerebellar function. Okay. Now just kind of add a little bit to that too, where you know, in, in addition to affecting the brain and cerebellum, it can affect like peripheral nerves and peripheral neuropathy and other issues that can even further a lot of the balance issues in particular. So there's even other effects that in a very similar way, you know, or is toxic to other parts of the nervous system that we're trying to avoid. Okay. So Hannah asks a tough one. If there's time, what are your thoughts on hyperbaric chambers? I have never recommended hyperbaric chambers for ataxia. Have have you all, or do you know anything about that? You know, within pediatrics, um, hyperbaric oxygen was a big fad about 10 to 15 years ago as a potential therapy for autism. And um, for autism, the, a lot of different therapies kind of come in and out um, of popularity based on reports. For children um, and some adults with mitochondrial disorders, as in the underlying reason for their symptoms, there has been some anecdotal evidence that hyperbaric oxygen can be helpful for mitochondrial disorders. The problem is that with ataxias, um, there are hundreds of different causes of ataxias. And if you don't have an ataxia where there is a problem with the respiratory chain or the way that um, energy is being made uh, in, in the cells and where free radicals are being generated and causing problems, it's hard to then um, rationalize the use of hyperbaric oxygen as a treatment. From a practical standpoint, the only places that I'm aware of now that have hyperbaric oxygen or offer it are usually places that are treating um, people who may have developed the bends from deep sea diving, um, right. where nitrogen is dissolved in the blood and you need to then, uh, it, you know, it's coming out of, of being dissolved too quickly and then you get the bends and then you need to go back under that high pressure and then gradually reemerge. Um, so even when I've had families who have asked about this for mitochondrial disorders, um, I can't get it. I can't even. I can't even um, find it as an option. And so, 
um, while this used to be very popular a number of years ago when people were doing this um, fairly frequently, um, it's really impractical now. Um, and there are some risks too, um, uh, to it in terms of a potential therapy. Um, oxygen is flammable. I know of at least one case, and there's always going to be that one, right? Um, <laughs> where uh, there was a fire related to using hyperbaric oxygen. Oh. Um, yeah, certainly, um, you know, it, it's an exception. There could be a fire roasting your turkey. There could be a fire, you know, microwaving food. And so there's nothing we do in this world is without risk. But I think it's really the issue um, for, for this and for many, many other treatments that we think about is that risk benefit. And right. if the if the risk is low and the benefit may also be low, it may still be worth it. It may still be worth trying it. Um, but if the, the risk is high, it may not be worth trying it. And things that we know are effective um, can be difficult to do and harder to, to do than um, take a treatment or take a pill. Um, so exercise and physical therapy, we know this is helpful. We know this delays the progression of ataxia regardless of the type of ataxia. We know that physical therapy can improve your balance and coordination and that you need to continue to do it in order for it to work. It's like practicing the piano. If you're not playing the piano, you're not gonna be able to play the piano. It's the same thing with the balance and coordination. But these take a lot of effort and a lot of commitment day after day after day. And it's hard to maintain sometimes, especially if the weather is bad or if you're quarantined and you can't go to the gym, um, or if you just don't have the opportunity to do these things. And so I understand that um, wanting additional treatments and therapies and options um, is, uh, in, you know, it's, it's gonna happen. Everybody wants to address this in a multimodal approach and with as many options as they have. But I think in terms of the hyperbaric oxygen specifically, there's not enough benefit um, for for the majority of people to warrant its use. Okay. Um, for Dr. Hawkins, do you foresee clinical trials for CBD? Yeah, so it's interesting. So there are definitely trials that have been investigated in other diseases, so for example, Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis and others where they've kind of tried to do them in a much more systematic way, comparing them to placebo and kind of giving a better sense of evidence. And I think that for the ataxia, is, you know, it's very similarly, it's kind of issues with a lot of our clinical trials, which I think probably Dr. Perlman and others have discussed, which is, do you kind of treat all the ataxias together? Or do you try to kind of separate them out into their individual sub-diseases? And then how much do you, numbers do you need to have to really kind of recognize some of the differences with this? In CBD, it's a little bit trickier because as I already showed you and mentioned, the multiple different varieties that are out there. Well, there's a whole issues on the, the treatment research side of things as far as regulations about which products are okay to use, how to kind of get that through the legal red tape, so to speak. So it does require a lot of um, elbow grease and ammunition to kind of get these studies up and running. And so whenever you need that extra effort, the, the other side of it is always the cost of these studies. And so a lot of kind of issues that come with CBD and the cannabis products, yeah, very similar to other supplements is unlike when they have pharmaceutical companies that can help really kind of put the amount of money and effort and energy to get them into trials, these suffer when you're trying to do these bigger trials of not having the appropriate funding. So it's, it's kind of an interesting kind of conundrum of there's a lot of kind of general interest, but not specific interest from certain backing to kind of promote some of these studies. I think that we'll learn a lot from our counterparts like in Parkinson's and others that we might be able to borrow at least the ideas about what's the proper dosing or products to investigate. And so I think that we'll certainly see smaller studies um, looking at you know, certain ataxia patients to kind of understand these in more detail. Um, it'd be interesting to see how much we kind of gain from the other ones because if they look like they're showing a lot of promise, that would certainly promote um, further backing to kind of expand in, into the other diseases such as the ataxias. So I, assuming that we kind of continue to see that there's some benefit with these and it does outweigh the risk within some of these other disease populations, I think we'll start seeing them um, more and more coming into the other neurogenic diseases, including the ataxias. Okay. Um, so our last question, and we do have some more questions, so I apologize if we didn't get to all of them, but I felt like I had to respond, is to uh, is from Aileen, and she says, my husband was diagnosed with cerebellar ataxia a few months ago. We don't know what kind it is, 
genetic or what, he hasn't walked in almost two years. A couple of months ago, his blood sugar dropped to 40 and he was able to get out of the house and walk across two fields, I'm sorry, two roads in a field. He collapsed and was incoherent when the police found him. How's this possible or could he be misdiagnosed? Um, so the reason I wanted to to answer this question or at least address this question is that, I mean, clearly you need to make sure that you're in the hands of uh, a neurologist or an ataxia specialist that you trust uh, that's made the diagnosis, that they're continuing to look at different potential causes. What we see a lot of times is people use the word ataxia loosely for anything where there might be some problems walking. Um, so really defining if it's truly a cerebellar ataxia and making sure that they've looked for those potentially treatable or reversible causes, I think is very, very important. So I'd just um, like to just um, ask you to please go back to uh, his physician and maybe take another look and, and ask the question that you just asked me. So um, with that, I think we'll, we'll wrap up. Laurie, did you want to say anything in, in way of goodbye yeah. to the... Thank, Thank you, you guys so, so much. much. <laughs> uh, we've covered so much information today on such a variety of topics. This is great. I learned so much. Um, certainly enjoyed Ricardo. That was such a fun illustration. Uh, Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Hawkins, Collins, and... Dr. Seberger, and as a reminder, a recording of this uh, webinar will be available, so you can uh, go back and catch anything that you might have missed on the recording, and you'll get that in a few days, and it'll also be posted on our website. I did post the link in the chat to the medications fact sheet that is found on our website, and also to the webinars page that um, has all of our past webinars on exercise and research and a variety of other topics and will include this webinar as well soon. So thank you all to, our, to all of our attendees that joined us here today. I wish you well. Take care and stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank you.